Hi, Tony from All The Remote Things back again. I've got a fantastic guest this week, Mike Cohen. So fantastic to have you on the cast. How are you? I'm good, Tony. Thanks for having me here. It's brilliant. We've been trying to get this one together for a while, which is great. And it's fantastic to have you on here. Just before we get started, though, team, if you're watching this and you want to stay connected, you want to learn more about our community, join our Discord server. All you've got to do is go to remoteaf.co. Click the button. There's a whole bunch of like-minded people talking about many of the things that we'll talk about today and talk about remote. Also, grab the grab an opportunity to look at the latest async blog. Links are in the description below. We'll see you there. We'll get on with the cast. Mike, fantastic to have you. Would you please introduce yourself for those who, if if is anyone that doesn't actually know you? <laughs> well, I'm sure there's quite I'm sure there's quite a few. I've just been lucky because I've been around Agile pretty much since the since the beginning. I started doing it before it was called Agile, just kind of got lucky and in, in stumbling into it. And then um was fortunate enough to be a co-founder of the Agile Alliance and the Scrum Alliance. And I um I run a company just helping teams succeed with Agile. It's kind of what I do these days. I've written a number of books on Agile and kind of got known by people through that. Yeah, and fantastic books and books that, that that I gravitated to early in my career. So I thank you for those when you know a much the same path thrown in in the very early days before it was called Agile. <laughs> Extreme yeah. programming, I think, was was, was go over and try <laughs> that thing. Um, but you know, then when we were looking for, for for how do we do this and how do we do that, you you wrote some great books, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. So well, thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, I, I, I you know still have a copy of it sitting over on the right <laughs> desk. So um, you know, it, it's been fantastic in the years. What I want to talk to you a little bit about today is Scrum Masters, and it, it's an interesting topic, I think, because. Still, it's as I work with organizations across the world, the question still asks, why do I need a Scrum Master? What is a Scrum Master? Isn't a Scrum Master just a project manager? And can I make him just a leader? And so I'm interested because, you know, you grew up in in, in Scrum and obviously with the Scrum Alliance. Talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on what a Scrum Master actually is and the value that they add. You know, I started doing this before we had the title Scrum Master, and I knew I needed somebody to run my Scrum teams, to lead my Scrum teams. I had my project managers do it. Um, but when I had hired project managers, I was always of the belief that there are two types of project managers, the good and the bad, right, of course. And the bad project managers were the ones who ran around with a clipboard and it says, Oh, Tony, it's Wednesday. Your name's on this task. You're not done. What's your corrective action plan? They didn't even understand the task. They just knew you were late, right? Um, and then the other type of project manager, the good type, they were they would walk up to somebody who was maybe on the due date for something and say, what can I do to help you, right? And they were all about helping people rather than just kind of this adherence to some magical schedule. And so those are the type of project managers I hired. And I said, yeah, I need you to run these scrum teams, do this. And they did great. They did great. And the type of project manager that always knew my job is to serve the team. How do I help a team be the best they can? That type of project manager converted very well for me into scrum master roles. Now, in saying all this, I'm not saying that a project manager is some form of a scrum master. I mean, they're very different mindsets, but the people that know that their job, the managers that know their job is to help a team, those guys make great scrum masters. And so a scrum master is somebody who helps the team achieve their best. They help them be the best they can. In extreme programming, which you mentioned a moment ago, XP, they had a role of the coach. And the coach was there to help help a team be the best it could. And so Scrum Master is really largely the same. And I think it is a hard thing to explain to people. When I teach it in classes, I actually have this one slide where I have 10 different pictures of what a Scrum Master is. And there are things like an orchestra conductor, they're Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, Yoda from Star Wars, um, a mechanic, a golf caddy. And we talk about it in classes, like why do each of these things represent one aspect of a scrum master? And I think if I have to, if I have to put up 10 pieces of art to represent what a scrum master is, that does mean it's hard to, to get our heads around that role. By the way, one of the pieces of art is um, Snoop Dogg, the rapper Snoop Dogg. So I actually use him as a, <laughs> as a representation of one aspect of what it's like to be a scrum master. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out where that where, where that that's in. 
<laughs> well, here's the thing. I sent my artist, again, these are slides in my class. I sent my artist a list of nine things. I said, draw me a golf caddy mechanic, et cetera. And he sent back 10 pieces of art, right? I didn't ask for 10. I asked for nine. He sent back 10. And he sent back Snoop Dogg for free because I just tossed in Snoop Dogg. And I said, why? Is he because he helps an agile team kind of stay chill, calm under pressure? And he said, no, isn't, you know, isn't Scrum all about collaboration? He said, Snoop Dogg's the master collaborator. He's on everybody's records. He cooks with Martha Stewart. So I left Snoop Dogg in my slide representing that a Scrum master is there to help encourage us to collaborate. So <laughs> That's brilliant. I was sort of <laughs> getting down the chilling sort of. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I thought. Keep us calm. So, one of the things I, I find a problem with now, though, is is that you know there are different um, scaling methods, shall we say, and and so yeah. with, you know, all of the different scaling methods, they tend to call them different things, and and so now we have you know um, perhaps you you might call them an RTE, or you know I'm, I'm not poking at those, but I'm just saying so so. The whole Scrum Master word seems to be something that people gravitate to. Either they either agree with it or they disagree. It's very polarizing. What are your thoughts on that? You know, when the term started, it it was meant to be different, and because we didn't want to just you know call it a project manager, even though it overlaps. Again, it's different, but there's overlap. It needed to be something different, or people wouldn't change their behavior enough. And I experienced this with one of my early project managers who I said, I need you to run the scrum team. Uh, he was brilliant, classically trained project manager, Harvard MBA, brilliant guy, but he failed miserably at being what today we would call a scrum master. And he, it was entirely my fault that he failed. We bought his company and I said, you're going to run scrum now instead of your waterfall process. I told him what it was all about, got him trained. He was on board, fully on board with it, but he fell back into his old habits. And it was my fault because I didn't change enough of his job. He had the same team, the same office, the same title. And so he just fell back into habits of being a little too directive. And um, the scrum master title was meant to be, oh, I'm a scrum master. I have a different title. I must behave differently. And so it made people think when, when it was new, it made people think about it. Now there's so many misperceptions about what a scrum master does. And I mean, I worry about people hearing me and misperceiving that, oh, it's just a type of project manager. It's not, it's just, you know, there's, it's like saying an athlete in, in basketball and an athlete in, in football, right? They're both athletes, but they're very different. And so it really does create a lot of confusion these days because there's so many misperceptions of what a scrum master should do. To that point, I think, you know, to help anyone who's watching this, if I said to you, you know, what are the the the, the real key things that a scrum master does that, that you know, um, sets them apart from the other roles? Mm -hmm. what would um, basically, you know, is we go back to the idea of being a servant leader, which is a term that comes from Robert Greenleaf um, back in the 70s and being there to serve the team and doing anything they can to help a team. That means, you know, anticipating problems, fighting battles for the team, doing anything like that to help them be the best they can. A problem with that is a lot of scrum masters kind of decrease their value by just kind of shifting into purely facilitator mode. Yeah, And it's like, oh, I facilitate our meetings or I take the notes, I do things like that instead of really trying to fight bigger battles, organizational impediments that are really slowing a team down. Um, and so a good scrum master is proactively seeking out ways to help that team be successful, looking for ways to, to improve their productivity um, and pushing teams. One of the classic examples we have with scrum masters is they're, they protect the team, right? So they protect the team from the boss that wants to redirect them or steal team members. And a classic example is to say we also protect teams from product owners who are pushing for too much. Totally buy that. Totally buy that. It's a great example. We protect the team from overbearing product owners. But Scrum Masters should also protect the team from complacency. And I sometimes get in trouble or criticized for this. But if I'm working with a team that has just you know, been doing the same amount of work for a year and it hasn't really improved, that's not a very agile team, right? An agile team wants to get better for their own sake, right? I mean, I just want to be, I just want to see how good we can be as a team. I want to just, the challenge of continually improving. And a scrum master protects the team from that complacency in the same way we push a, we protect from a scrum, from a 
overbearing product owner, meaning I might go to a team and say, I think you guys can do more, right? We've been doing this amount of work for the last year or so. Let's let's kick it up a notch. Let's see what we can do. Uh, let's try to work with more focus or whatever it is. Let's see if we can kick it up. And so I think that's different in some ways because that's not about I want more from you team for the evil company that pays our bills. It's more, I want us to be better to see if we can be better, right? It's our own pride in our work. And that's a little bit of a difference for me in a scrum master in more traditional roles. Yeah. So, so the other thing I, I really want to sort of cover in that, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what you're saying. So when I first started doing this, one of the best scrum masters I ever worked with, and shout out to you, Todd, when you watch this, you'll know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> he does now. <laughs> and he was one of the best scrum masters I ever worked with. He, he was still on the tools. He was still developing, still doing the work. But he said, "I'll take the scrum master role," and he did the scrum master role as well as doing the work. Now, yep, that seems to have shifted, and it, it, it seems to have shifted seismically to the fact that the scrum master is 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 a solo role, versus that it's actually someone in the team that actually does it as as part of what they do. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I have never thought or experienced as one that you're just a scrum master for one team. Um, I think what you're describing is I'm a scrum master and let's say a programmer. Totally cool with that. Might be better off that I'm a scrum master for two teams, right? That might be better. We could debate that. I, I'm open to either way. It depends on the person largely. but. Yeah. I just don't buy that um, being a scrum master for one team is a full-time job for very long. It might be at the beginning. Um, you know, if you think about the beginning, um, a team needs a lot of help, right? They need a lot of coaching. And I often think of, um, and I, I hate part of where this metaphor will go, but I think of um, a new scrum team as similar to like a, a little kid's team learning to play football, right? And what a horrendous job for the coach, right? You're coaching the little <laughs> six-year-olds, right? Um, I I would love to be a World Cup coach. That looks like a fun job. Full-time coach of the little six-year-olds, not for me, right? Um, and so that's what it's like with a brand new scrum team. You have to coach them on the rules and behavior and everything else. And it's hard. And it could be a full-time job. And in an organization that's new to Agile, there's a lot of organizational impediments you might be fighting. Totally buy that that's a full-time job could be a full-time job. Eventually, you're going to fix those problems. Eventually, the team learns how to do the role themselves. And it's not a full-time job at that point. And at that point, if it's me, I can start coding now, or maybe I go work with a second team. So I'm just not a believer that Scrum Master is full-time one team. In fact, it actually might get easier if you have multiple teams. Now, not brand new teams that are, you know, crazy uh, time consumers, but let's take two kind of teams that are starting to get it. Suppose you have an organizational impediment you want to fight with, um, I don't know, human resources. Human resources wants all the reviews to be based on a certain set of uh, criteria, and they're all very individual based and they go against teamwork. And I want to go to human resources and, or personnel department and argue against that. And I'm representing one team. Yeah. They're not going to listen to me as much as if I'm representing two or three teams, right? And so sometimes fighting the organizational impediments is easier when I represent multiple teams. And so I just don't buy that it's full-time permanently, one scrum master, one team only. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I guess the thing for me is always, you know, how experienced is the scrum master? How experienced is the team? Yep. What's the construct of the organization? But it is something that we see and the question gets asked all the time. So it's really good to have you you talk about that. So um, we might sort of walk to the right now and think about, okay, when we're, we're talking about agile teams and one of the thing, great things that you do is, is talk about user stories. You know, you're really the dictionary on user stories, if I could use it that way. <laughs> um, by the way, if anyone's watching this, Mike is the king of the dad jokes. And, and <laughs> we just little backwards and forwards because in, in my world and my family, I'm the, the king of the dad jokes, but he is the king. Anyway. Well, that's our that's our claim to fame together. So, <laughs> well, I think it goes hand in hand. The reason I introduced it right there because I reckon it goes hand in hand with being able to write good user stories. Anyway, <laughs> so so what I wanted to talk about was everybody's probably heard the concept. Or if you're watching this, you've heard the concept of user stories. The question that always get and people struggle with even now. You know, in my early career, I started as a BA and I was a traditional BA and then I got thrown into that project and then I had to, to conquer this, this user story. We're still seeing that today. Yeah. 
And even when you've been doing it for a while, it's about how do you write better user stories and how do you make those stories actually useful to the team? And, and I'm really interested to hear, because I know that you've been doing a lot of that lately. <laughs> Yeah, we've been doing a, a class on better user stories, a Zoom class on that, just because I do I do see it as a constant struggle with teams. Um, one of the first things for me is to acknowledge that not everything on a backlog should be a user story. Um, and I mean, I'm probably at fault for part of this, but I mean, I'll meet teams and they'll call everything on a backlog a user story, right? And some of the things on my backlog are things like upgrade the Linux server. That's not a user story. It's just, you know, upgrade the Linux server um, or fix the bug when the user enters a negative value in this field, right? And those don't have to be user stories. So user stories, I think come two ways. They're a promise to have a conversation, right? So we write it down and we're basically telling the stakeholders or users, we're not going to build this thing until we talk to you and get more detail, which means they don't have to give us all the details up front. And then second, I think of them not as a requirement. People will talk about user stories are the requirements. I don't think of them that way. I think of them as pointers to the requirements. And they can very often just point to a conversation. I go to the customer and I say, what do you want? Okay. So it pointed to the conversation. Other times it might point to a, an Excel spreadsheet saying, perform the calculation this way. Here's some samples. And so pointers to requirements and promises to have those conversations and when we acknowledge that, it helps us lighten up and not worry about writing the perfect sentence or having everything on the backlog be a user story. It's a, it's an interesting because I, I I hear a lot of people talk about it. one of the ones I hear you know, wow the user story has to be it has to be a verb it can't be a noun or it has to be you know so oh yeah and, and oh. <laughs> people get confused right and then they go well what am I supposed to write here. And then the other the other derivative that you see is it's got complicated. So, you know, user stories now, the user story has to as if and the et cetera. And now I have to have acceptance criteria and I have to have a definition of ready and I have to have a definition of done. And it, it's interesting that you say keep them simple. You, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I liked use cases, switching to use cases here for a moment. When use cases first came out, we were, we both know Alistair Coburn, and he wrote a really good book called Writing Effective Use Cases. Um, I love that book, and I probably bought 100 or 200 copies of that book, and I gave them out to various clients when I was working with them, and we would try to write use cases. And the problem with use cases was they held a lot of promise, but they never really worked out as well in practice because they were a little too complicated. Our stakeholders had to understand primary actors and secondary actors and preconditions and postconditions, all those other stuff. And I see some of the same movement with stories where people are trying to make them too complicated. And I'm just not that ambitious that I want to create like a perfect sentence, right? It's just a promise to go talk, right? I, it's a reminder of what that conversation should be about. So I look at the story and I say, hey, I wrote down that we were going to do such and such. And that's enough to get started. It doesn't have to be more than that. And these complications with things like a definition of ready, which I think is a horrible idea, and creating these really complicated story hierarchies, Right. I've seen them, I think, as many as seven layers in a hierarchy where you started out with you started out with a saga, then you had an epic, uh -huh. um, then you had okay. feature, <laughs> you had headline, and you had story. And then you went down to acceptance criteria and tasks. And so, I mean, it was just nuts. And people were asking me, like, how do I know which one's a saga? And it's like, I don't. They're all user stories. You know, it's, it's like the old joke. It's like it's turtles all the way down, right? The turtles down in the back of another turtle. To me, it's just user stories all the way down, and some stories are big. If you want to call them a name, go for it, but it's just stories inside of stories. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting one. We, I, I had flagged with you, talking, but I think it's a good juncture point to talk about that as well. So first I'll just say, the, the other thing I hear a lot is, oh, you have to have technical stories, and then you have to have business user stories, and you have to have stories that cover X. But for me, they're just... <laughs> user stories, right? Because somebody's going to use it in some, the, the, the key is in the name. Do you see that happening? Yeah, that's, you know, that one's interesting for me because, you know, I'm going back to use cases for a second and use cases didn't talk about users. They talked about actors, right? And that was nice because the actor was most commonly a user, but sometimes it was a system, right? I'm going to send data to another system and the system's going to act on it. So they called them actors. And 
when I find something I like, the last thing I ever want to do is take somebody else's idea and put my own words on it, right? And that's what we see people do all the time, but it's not what I want to do. And so when I saw user stories first time from Kent Beck, and I started talking about, I didn't want to change its vocabulary. So I kept them called user stories. On the other hand, if I went back and let's say in some alternate universe, I invented the idea, I might've called them actor stories. And I can't decide if that would have been good or bad. It probably would have been bad because I like the focus on the user, but it would have got rid of the issues of people like I was talking to a couple today whose stories were largely other systems yeah. acting on their uh, you know business intelligence type systems and big data and acting on it. And it would have been a lot easier to call them actor stories in that world. But I don't really want to do that de-emphasis of the user part, right? Um, because it does bring up questions of can actors, can, non, can non-user can non actors be in our stories? Yeah, I, I like that. And, and I think the other thing that, that goes hand in hand with what you were saying before we get to the structure of the story is, is that, you know, I was always, oh, there was a there was a phase where all stories must be small. Now, I know, you know, the smaller you make the story, the easier it is, more visibility, and it'll it'll create flow. But sometimes big stories are okay as well. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, totally. Um, I think big stories can be a huge benefit. One of the common challenges people have with stories is dependency management. And one of the best ways to manage dependencies is to not have any. And I know that's silly, but the way you don't have dependencies is leave a story big. And when it's further down in the backlog, you're better off with this is a big story. As it moves to the top of the backlog, that's when you want to break the story into, let's say, five pieces. And yep, now you have dependencies. Those five pieces are all interrelated. But guess what? You're going to finish all five stories in, let's say, the next two sprints. So you've got to manage dependencies. You've got to keep them straight in your head for two sprints. Not a big deal. Right. And so I like bigger stories if they're further down on the backlog. If we're about to do it, that's when we're going to break it up. And that's when we're going to have small stories. But both big and small stories have their purpose. And I would not want everything um, on my backlog to be small. I'd go nuts because we'd have too many items. Yeah. So you're going to go from, you know, you have four or five times as many items on your backlog and you're going to have four or five times as many dependencies. Yeah, and I think if you're watching this and you're new to them, that's the balance, right? Because I see it go either way. There, so the stories become all big and all massive, or so small that yep. you've got overkill. Is there's a balance in it and sensibility in it as well? I visualize it as like an iceberg, and you've got small things at the top of the iceberg. You got a little bit bigger below that, and you got the waterline, and you don't even know what's under the waterline, right? But and I don't remember the, the the science. I don't remember the number, but it's always something like ninety percent of an iceberg is underwater, right? You're only seeing t- top part of it. Totally buy that, right? Ninety percent of my backlog is underwater. It's big, huge things. Don't even know what they are yet. I may know a few of them, but I'm not paying them any attention. Yeah, so so I think that's a good segue into <laughs> the good segue into the structure of stories or, or or the breakdown of stories. So you you know so I I hark back to you know I obviously started an XP so use cases and then went into the, the use of stories and you know it was feature epic was a thing that might be there if you were looking to break it down but it was sort of a key to go oh you know yeah it's too big we want to break it down some more yep. and stories but. Literally, that was it. You know, I, I worked on a project where we built an internet banking system and we had features and stories and that was it, you know. That was and that's the- enough. Yeah. Now we have feature and epic and story and task and subtask. And even to <laughs> add into that landscape, let's go the other way. There are certain scaling systems that have gone and flipped it. Now we have epic and feature and story. What, what are your thoughts on this madness? I mean, to me, it's just become madness. It is. It's just, it just makes it too complicated. And I feel like sometimes people want to make things complicated so that they have something to sell, right? If I make this complicated and if I'm the one that invented it, you got to hire me to, to help you fix it, right? Because I'm the only one that understands it. And I work with companies that will have these complicated hierarchies and I'm, I'm pretty familiar with this type of stuff. I'm fairly smart overall. I can't handle it, right? I'm just like, whatever. It's just an item. It's just a backlog item. And I don't want to deal with the complicated hierarchies. Now, I can see where there's value in some of these ideas. But what I do is instead of having a hierarchy, I tend to think of them as being tagged, right? And so a lot of times people want to use feature to mean something that's big enough to release. And great, that might be a useful designation in our backlog. But use it, you know, put a little hashtag feature, 
on those items. Don't make it a hierarchy and, oh, every feature has to have items and everything has to belong to a feature. Just little hashtags. And that way you can, you know, show me all the things that are that are about to release. Just do a search in your tool and you'll see them. But it doesn't have to be a hierarchy. It's a lot easier if we just think of things as loosely tagged. And I think the more the more you break it into those different buckets, the, the more convoluted it becomes and the harder it becomes to do things like estimating and planning anyway. Well, you end up with more items. I mean, go back with what I said, which is something that's very common. Every every story has to be part of an epic and every epic has to be part of a theme. Now I have this artificialness instead of just and have a story and have it tagged, right? So I've got three things instead of one thing. And it, it just doesn't add any value. And the cognitive load it puts on a team is huge to have to deal with this. It, every team I work with that has like a hierarchy like that is looking for guidance. How do I know which level this goes into? The other thing I see is that, that, that um, um, I have to tread carefully, but there are certain um, consultancies, we'll, we'll just use that big bucket, but uh, are very happy to purvey the fact that, you know, an epic must be fortnight long and a story yeah. must be X and feature then Y. What you what, What's your thoughts on it? I mean, you know, I've read your planning book, but but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it these days now that, you know, things have progressed. Where does it sit in that mix for you? You know, again, with, with my approach where it's just stories all the way down, it's just stories inside of stories, I'm going to have some story stories that are months, right? Um, somebody else might call that a, an initiative or a, an epic, um, but it's just, it's just a story and it happens to be a big one. And so... I'm just I'm just in favor of simplicity and anything that we can do to keep this easier is going to leave us brain power for actually building the product instead of just talking about the product. So um, I avoid guidelines where, you know, this has got to be bigger than X, this has to be smaller than Y. It's just not worth doing that. I do want small things at the top of the backlog. I do want big things further down, but I don't really want to put restrictions um, or even kind of targeted sizes on those. I might have a target size for you know, nothing bigger than X comes into our sprint, but that'd be about the only limit. Yeah, that's that's a reasonable limit though, right? Because yeah. you're just going to blow your sprints to to, yeah. to daylights, right? Um, it it leans into estimating and 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 planning um, and story points. So I'm going to tackle tackle the contentious story point question. <laughs> um, we see now that story points. When I first learned story points. No, nothing more, nothing less to allow the team to understand their ability to deliver to their demand and to deliver to what they understood as their ability to deliver, right? They become yep. industry now. So story points, let me just go through a couple of things. Story points are used to create velocity, which is then used to match against other teams and your velocity should be the same as their velocity and their story points. Um, worst thing I've ever seen, personal story points, so yeah. you have to be able to you have to be able to deliver five story points, um, offshore or distributed teams or however you want to use that language. They have to deliver thirty three story points in a sprint to be paid. Yep. What's your thoughts, Mike? What talk to me about that because you've seen it from the beginning to now. Yeah, I see the I've seen those same dysfunctionalities, and often my message to some leader, manager, director in those type of companies is, look, you can use these that way, but what you're going to do is you're going to ruin the best way you have for having a team estimate their work. Um, when you tell a team you've got to deliver 33 points or you don't get paid, and I've seen the same thing, they're just going to start to inflate their numbers, right? And they're just going to make sure they're going to be very conservative. So they'll make things a little bit higher and they will hit 33. It might be what they previously would have called 20, but they yeah. will make that number. Um, and that's pointless. It's just absolutely pointless. And what we do when organizations do yeah, that, just ruin what would otherwise be a really good way to estimate. Um, I have been obsessed with estimating since 1998. Um, I worked at a company and I, I was a, the VP of software development. I had this really cool boss, the CEO, who was cool in the sense that he knew not every project would be successful. Not every project would be on time. And what this allowed me was time to experiment, the opportunity to experiment on products. And I had my various teams each estimate a different way. The only rule we had was you cannot estimate your project the way of any other team. And so we had teams that were doing what's called parametric estimating, right? Figure out parameters, multiply them all together, get an estimate, possibly good approach. 
We had other teams doing times. We had other teams doing checklists. We had teams trying with story points um, a little bit later. And as a project finished, a team would start its next project. Again, they had to find a new way to estimate. It couldn't be their exact previous way. They had to tweak it a little bit. And what this led to is a very cycling, very fast cycling through of ideas. And we kind of uh, coalesced around story points, this kind of abstract relative way of estimating in the um, early 2000, 2001. By then that was starting to be the way we did it because other approaches were not as successful. And so when organizations introduce these dysfunctionalities you're describing, we ruin what could be their best way of estimating. And all we get is one more way to yell at a team, right? You know, you didn't deliver me enough work. I'm not going to pay you, right? You didn't deliver me 33. I'm not going to pay you, right? It ruins it. Uh, and whilst those ones I find easy to deal with, and for the same reasons you talk, like when I say easy to deal with, easy to talk to people about, say, this is why you should not do this. And the, yep. The one that really... Uh, sort of sticks in my craw, if you like, <laughs> is is this this creation of velocity and then saying that team should meet this, you should all be the same velocity. Yeah. The, so velocity match, I find that so detrimental. What's your thoughts and how would you talk to someone about that? Because I know there are a lot of other people who have that conversation as well. I, a lot of times I have that in terms of a sports analogy and I'm not a big fan of sports analogies because who knows who likes a sport, you know, thing like that. But this is an easy one. So I'll just go to somebody and say, pick your favorite sport. Should all teams in that sport score the same number of points every game? Right. Um, no, right. Some are better. Some are worse. Um, some are playing with an injured superstar. Some are not. And so I don't look at that and say, everybody should score, you know, two points or a basketball game. Everybody should score 97 points. And most of them will get that and then understand, okay, well, when I have different teams, yeah, that team is, they're higher paid. They got two really good people on there. They're going to outperform, right? Um, and maybe we could look at that a way a, a sports team looks at it and goes, uh-oh, you know, for what they're getting paid, that team is delivering more than this team or something in some cosmic sense, perhaps. But the problem is it's very hard to estimate work meaningfully in a meaningful way and we would have to we would have to standardize on the story points and that's just not effectively going to happen in an organization what your team calls one point is not going to be what my team calls one point we yeah. can try to get there and i have seen it done i've been part of that where we get it done but only in kind of limited senses you know maybe five to seven teams very high trust environments where we could all agree we're an estimate with the same scale. Yeah. Um, but when we get bigger than that, we start to bring in, you know, we don't trust management to not abuse these numbers and things like that. Yeah, I talk about, talk about you can standardize the scale, but you can't normalize it, I guess is the point, right? Right, yeah. right. Which is the, the differential in that. Um, the, the the last one I want to really tackle with, because we're getting close to our time, is, is the the is the dollars to estimate to, the, to story points to how do, how do, how do organisations equate? And that's always the question that's asked when you talk to leaders, right? All right, these teams are using this new way, of, which is not new, by the way. We've been doing this for, like you said, <laughs> you know, years now. But anyway, this yep. is doing stuff. How do I turn that into an estimate? How do I turn that into, you know, man days, et cetera? Lovely. Well, this is why when I or when I wrote a book on this back in 2005, um, the book was called Agile estimating and planning because they're different acts, right? And I want to think about the estimating is about the effort to deliver the work. How much work is there to do? And uh, let's just ignore points and days or whatever. There's just, you know, it's, we're a landscaping company and we're moving, we're moving brick and we've got to move a hundred kilos of brick, right? I know I have to move this amount of work, hundred kilograms of work. And that is separate from the, then the duration and that's the planning, right? If I have um, you and I were both, uh, you know, fairly strong, can do this. You and I could move that at a certain rate. Um, you, you know, we've got, um, we've got kids, let's have our kids do it. They're not going to move it as quickly as you and I. Right. And so the duration is separate. So I like to think about estimate the size of work and then derive the duration. And we derive the duration based on past experience. And so we could look at it and say, well, this team averages 20 kilograms of work moved a an hour. We've got 100 kilograms of brick to move, 100 divided by 20, we're done in five. So estimating's hard. The planning isn't necessarily hard because we can base that 
on data. And in the example I just gave, it was literally nothing more than math. In terms of turning it into uh, an amount, a, a dollar or euro amount, it's actually pretty straightforward. What I have teams or organizations do is look at how much they paid, and let's make it easy, one team. How much did we pay a team over the last month or year? And then divide that by the number of story points that we delivered in that year. Just did this in January with a team. And they had, um, I don't remember the numbers, but they had delivered, let's say it was um, uh, uh 300,000, um, paid $300,000 to the team and they delivered a um, thousand points, right? Divide that out. We get 300,000 divided by hundred, we get $3,000, right? And so their cost was $3,000 a point. Now that doesn't mean I can go to a team and give them $3,000 and I get one point yeah. back, yeah, yeah. right? But on average, that was their number, right? And in a meeting about two weeks later, they um, the team presented something to the product owner and they said, it's going to take, um, I think it was eight points. He goes, huh, $24,000. No, I don't want this. Let's not do this, right? And so that let him have a dollar amount in his mind for when he was looking at things. Otherwise, I don't know, it's like, you know, I, I would travel, go to another country and it was sometimes easier to spend money because I didn't really know what it was, right? I'm having to, you know, divide it out in my head. And if it was somewhere easy, the currency was easy to do, I could do it. But other places it's, you know, how much did I just spend on dinner? Right. And this made it concrete for that product owner and for that organization to be able to look at what things cost. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, I like that the key factor there that he, he started to look at it for the dollars worth of what he's going to get. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, it really changed his thinking. That is a change to think. Mike, we were we were right at the end of our time and it's been a pleasure to have you on. I, I know we've backtracked through some things that came from the past and the future, but you know, it's been fantastic. I think a, a lot of these things are still happening, still being asked, and it's fantastic to hear from someone like yourself. Um Thank you. how can people get in touch with you. How can people get involved if 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 they necessarily wish to? Yeah, best way to reach me is um through my website at uh, mountaingoatsoftware.com. So which is a mountain of lots of free stuff as well. That you, <laughs> <laughs> there's a plug for you. <laughs> it is. We've got, uh, I've been blogging there for 20 years. So there's a lot of stuff there. So, and I've got a, a reinvigorated my YouTube channel. I'm trying to do at least one to three videos a week. So um, see if I can make even more content this year has been my goal. Brilliant. Jump on there, encouraging him to write another book and expand on all the things. <laughs> That's what I say. Look, thank you for, for being with us today and being on all the remote things. Um, if you're watching this, don't forget to like, subscribe. All the details that we've talked about will be in the uh, comments below. Mike Cohen, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you on all the remote things today. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate being here.